Good morning. Welcome to the online worship for the Bourne Katamit West Falmouth Parish. We will begin our service by singing Shalom. Our Psalter this morning is Psalm 14. Fools say in their hearts, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none that does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on all people to see if there are any that are wise who seek after God. They have all gone astray. They are all alike perverse. There is none that does good. No, not one. Have they no knowledge, the evildoers who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord? There they shall be in great terror, for God is with the generation of the righteous. You would confound the plans of the poor, but the Lord is their refuge. Oh, that deliverance for Israel would come from Zion. When the Lord restores their fortunes, Jacob shall rejoice and Israel shall be glad. And now we will sing hymn 111, How Can We Name a Love?
Please join me in our opening prayer. Loving and mysterious God, you who perform miracles in the sight of all to see, who can feed us all with your word, still our minds and open our hearts that we may understand, believe, and be changed. Amen. Our gospel reading this morning is from John chapter 6, verses 1 through 21. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled 12 baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were terrified. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. Then they wanted to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land toward which they were going. May these words speak to us today. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God, the creator of all that is. The lectionary reading for today is lengthy and has many pieces for us to think about. The first portion deals with a story that we refer to as the feeding of the 5,000. It's a story which is reported in all four of the Gospels. This is very familiar territory, familiar since our Sunday school days. A large crowd has followed Jesus, fascinated and excited by the miracles of healing that he's performed. Jesus goes up into the mountain with his disciples and looks down to see the size of the crowd and says to Philip, where are we to buy bread for all these people to eat? Jesus sees himself as the host since he's thinking about providing the food. And scripture tells us that he asked Philip the question as a test to see what Philip would say. Jesus already knew what he was going to do. And Philip, being good at calculation, says that six months' wages would not buy sufficient food for that crowd, even if there were some place to buy it. But Simon Peter's brother, Andrew, points to a little boy in the crowd who has a few loaves of bread and a couple fish. Do we pay attention that it is the child in the crowd who has what is necessary for this occasion? And Jesus says, make the people sit down. How do you make 5,000 people standing on a hillside sit down? I confess to being curious. 
Scripture reports that there was a lot of grass, so they were comfortable sitting. It has the feel of an impromptu picnic. Jesus took the bread and the fish and gave thanks for it, and then distributed it. When the feast is over, he instructs the disciples to gather up leftovers so nothing is wasted. And they had 12 full baskets of food after all those people ate their fill. And this was another sign to the people of Jesus' authority. They said, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. But it is the next line in our reading that has really captured my mind and my heart this week. It says, when Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. I want to pay attention to this part particularly. Jesus did not come to be king, to be the kind of ruler or even the kind of Messiah that the people were expecting. When the prophets talked about the Messiah, they envisioned someone of great military power and might, someone who would command respect and could whip up an army and restore land and power to the people of Israel. They thought the Messiah would be in charge of the government. And because he would be holy and chosen by God, the government, therefore, would be righteous, without corruption. It would be an institution to serve the people in truth and integrity. Jesus was not a mighty military leader. In fact, he was the opposite of what the prophets seemed to predict. He was gentle and humble. He talked to people and healed them. He taught an upside-down view of the world, one in which the poor were beloved and the rich had difficulty finding God. He ignored the parts of his tradition which he felt did not contain the spirit of the law. So people saw Jesus sitting down to eat with anyone and everyone, the folks that his, his tradition considered unclean and forbade him to have any part of. He even had long conversations with single women who were not his mother or sister. Shocking and unacceptable behavior in the Middle East. No wonder the religious authorities were afraid of him, even as they hated him. We remember that in Scripture, often after Jesus performs miracles, that he instructs people not to tell anyone what they've seen. It is not a strange sense of modesty. It is Jesus protecting himself from crowds that wish to carry him away and crown him. It is not yet his time. There's another layer still here. Listen again. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Take him by force. Make him a king. The forces of the world continue to try and shove square pegs into round holes. It is human to want closure and order, to name and label things. This makes it easier for us to understand things. But we know that labels do not really define, they just limit. If we say, she is elderly, our minds will not immediately think she is wise, but rather she's limited in mobility. Have you not all had the experience of someone being surprised to learn something new about you when they had been a friend or colleague of many years? I never knew you could play the piano. I didn't know you spent time in Japan. You never told me your sister was in the Peace Corps. We can even sometimes feel upset when we discover there is more to a person than we knew. We thought we knew the person, as though that meant knowing everything about him or her. Don't we all jump to conclusions about people based on the little that we know? It is dangerous for us to do so. We are often wrong, and being wrong wouldn't be such a bad thing 
if we weren't also so sure of being right? Who were the ones, I wonder, who were going to take Jesus by force and make him king? They probably believed it was the right thing to do. Did they give thought to the fact that Jesus himself did not seem interested in a path to power? Did they think he was being shy or coy? Or did they just think they knew better than he? But I noticed, too, that Jesus did not engage with them, argue with them, refuse to cooperate with them, or denounce them. He simply goes off to the mountains by himself. As we observe when we read the prophets, once the prophet has stated his case for God, he stops. Other prophets may contradict him, or the people may refute him. But the prophet does not argue. He knows his job is to tell the truth and to know when to stop. Arguing and fighting do not change people's minds. Perhaps Will Rogers was a, a better theologian than we realized when he said, never miss a good opportunity to shut up. That is advice we should all take more often, I suspect. But how is the world doing the same thing to us? Have you ever been pushed into a job you didn't want because others thought you'd be really good at it? And do we listen when other people say no? Encouraging people is wonderful. Seeing gifts in people, no doubt those who were ready to make Jesus king could clearly see his. But deciding for other people is not. Letting other people decide for us is not. People need their own agency. We rob them of their dignity when we decide for them. And we unravel our relationships if we continue to ignore the evidence of their discomfort or rebellion when we are overly enthousi enthusiastic or aggressive in our zeal to help. One of the first things we notice about Jesus is his gentleness his way of looking at people straight into the heart. Even reading the stories, you can envision his calm and inviting presence. He's not anxious. He does not talk to excess. He's a really good listener. And most often, he gives people information through parable and story, and then lets them make up their own minds. He tells them how to look not what to see. It is so deeply respectful and loving to offer patience to people with their struggles rather than just patching them up and sending them off. It isn't enough for Jesus to heal people. They have to be touched. They have to know that they are loved. So how we do things is as important as what we do. How we deal with each other and how we allow others to deal with us tells the story of who we think we are. And how do we stand firm with God when our culture and our friends and the news and the little nagging voices in our heads so often tell us that we are not enough, not lovable? Whom do we trust? We cannot build our faith on the sand of culture or what other people think of us. Following Jesus will require nothing less than all you have and all that you are. It must be a complete surrender. We will have to do as he did, say and do what we must, and skip the arguing and go to the hills to be alone when others try to cram us into their image of who we are. We are not who other people think we are. We are who God says we are. We can only talk about life with God in metaphor. It is the only language that can deal richly and imaginatively with mystery. This poem by Carol Bielek helps us to imagine a way of being. It is called Breathing Underwater. She writes, I built my house by the sea, not on the sands, mind you, not on the shifting sand. 
and I built it of rock, a strong house by a strong sea. We got well acquainted, the sea and I, good neighbors, not that we spoke much, we met in silences, respectful, keeping our distance, but looking our thoughts across the fence of sand, always the fence of sand our barrier, always the sand between. And then one day, and I still don't know how it happened, the sea came, without warning, without welcome even, not sudden and swift, but a shifting across the sand like wine, less like the flow of wine than the flow of blood, slow but coming, slow but flowing like an open wound. And I thought of flight, and I thought of drowning, and I thought of death. And while I thought, the sea crept higher till it reached my door. And I knew then there was neither flight, nor death, nor drowning. That when the sea comes calling, you stop being neighbors, well acquainted, friendly at a distance neighbors. And you give your house for a coral castle and you learn to breathe underwater. Like Jesus, we will figure out how to be authentically who we are, accepting the mess and the mystery that life on earth often is. We know that God can supply grace for every moment and that we also can learn to breathe underwater. May it be so. Amen. In deep silence, in the presence of God and surrounded by friends, we quiet our hearts and still our minds to offer our prayers. O oh God of us all, prepare our hearts to listen and to be moved. Make us dare to open the desires of our hearts, and may we all pray for the things we hold close. We pray for the concerns of our church family and community. Help us to make space in our being for you to dwell so that we are not conformed to the world or overwhelmed by the world or intimidated and confused by others. Help us to stand firm in your love, O Lord, so that we can always breathe in your Holy Spirit no matter what is happening around us. And so we pray together the words that Jesus taught. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please join me in the prayer of dedication. We offer ourselves to you, O Lord, and also these gifts from our hands and hearts. Bless the gifts we offer, and bless us as we work to be a light in the darkness everywhere we are. Amen. So go forth in peace, protected by God's extravagant love. 
Remember always that you are a child of God and that the Holy Spirit dwells in you. When you find yourself surrounded by darkness, be the light. Honor and glorify God in every moment of your living. Amen.